happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake. But the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we have worked all night and caught nothing, but I'll do as you say and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to the partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Peter saw what he saw, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which, had, which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Be not afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything, and they followed him. My sisters and brothers, this is the gospel of our Lord. Lady seated. My brother, my sister, the call of God is upon your life. Whether you know it or not, God lays claim to you. You may think that your life is your own, that it's your unique possession, and that you're free to do whatever you wish with your life. Well, indeed, it's true. God has granted you freedom to make choices, to do whatever you would like with your life. But ultimately, your life is not your own. It never was. Your life belongs to God, and it is hidden with Christ in the mystery of God who is our creator. God lays claim upon your life by virtue of the fact that you are a creature and he is the divine creator and that you are no action, act, accident, but rather you are the result of the intentional will and action of God. He is the one who has called you into being and into existence. He is the one who lays claim now upon your life and he calls you to fulfill a mission that is unique to you. God has a purpose for your life, and he intends to use you if you are willing. God lays claim on your life not only because he is the creator of your very existence, but he also lays claim on your life because he's in the process of redeeming you and saving you for purposes that would stagger your imagination. 700 years before Jesus of Nazareth, there was a man called Isaiah. He was a prophet, but he wasn't always a prophet. He grew up in the city of Jerusalem. He grew up a wealthy man, for he was a relative of the king. He was a part of the royal family of David, although this was some 200 years after the lifetime of David. David was his ancestor as well. But he also was a man who was a priest from his mother's side, I suppose. And so he spent his life in the great and holy temple that was built by Solomon in the city, the holy city of Jerusalem. And it was a magnificent building. I'm sure if you were to see it, that it would have been considered one of the great wonders of the ancient world. It would not last. It would be destroyed by the Babylonians. But that was yet to come. Isaiah was carrying out his priestly function within the temple in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And as he was within the temple offering the daily incense offering, 
because incense was constantly burned in the presence of God. For the incense itself and the smoke of the incense was a reminder of that which is called the presence. And whenever you said the presence, everyone knew who you were referring to. Because God would often appear to their ancestors in the form of a great cloud of smoke or a great pillar of fire. It reminds you of the story of Moses ascending the great mountain in Sinai. And there on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, uh, the summit was enveloped in this great uh, manifestation of holy fire and holy smoke. And in the midst of the lightning and the peals of thunder, God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments and the instruction for the people of Israel that is called Torah. This is the story that has been handed down to uh, the people of Israel from generation to generation. And this holy, the holy fire and the holy smoke of God would then, in this great cloud, lead the children of Israel in the wilderness. And they were guided because they were a chosen people. They were a people who were called forth from, by God for a special and unique purpose and function in the world and on the stage of human history. Isaiah was in the temple offering the daily incense offering when all of a sudden he was overtaken by a tremendous vision. He saw the Lord high and lifted up upon his glorious throne and the train of his garments filled the entire temple. And Isaiah responded with great fear. He was terrified at such a sight. And not only did he see, behold, the Lord in all of his glory and majesty, as the temple was filling with the smoke of the incense, but he also beheld other angelic beings surrounding the throne of God, and they were crying out their song of eternal praise, one to another, in an antiphonical kind of way. And they were singing these words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with his glory. And they continuously sang this angelic hymn of praise unto the one who was and who is and who is to come, the God of Israel. And Isaiah was overcome by this great vision and he was terrified. I know that oftentimes we are tempted and we often may find ourselves praying, Oh God, if you would just show yourself to me, I would be happy. You do not know what you asked for. Isaiah saw God, and Isaiah was utterly and completely overtaken by uh, awe and by a terrifying feeling. He felt that he was standing in the presence of the holiness of God and that he had no right to stand. He was aware that he was but a creature facing his creator. And so Isaiah was overwhelmed and he, he says these words, I'm a man of unclean lips, of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah became profoundly aware of his inadequacy. My brothers and sisters, to behold the grandeur and the majesty and the holiness of the glory of God that is a revelation. But there's also another revelation that occurs. You become aware about the truth about yourself. And the truth is that we are all inadequate. We all fall short. And that we are people of unclean lips because we can give praise to God at one moment and then on the freeway we can curse our neighbor. We are all guilty. Isaiah was profoundly aware of his unworthiness before God and he trembled and shook in terror. But God is merciful. God is gracious. It is as if God didn't even notice uh, that Isaiah was feeling so insecure. And so God sends one of the cherubims, the cherubim was an angel who took a coal from the incense altar a hot coal, and I know those coals get hot because sometimes we burn incense here. And he put it on the uh, tongue of Isaiah. Now this was part of the vision. I know, I'm not sure or his tongue was miraculously spared. Uh, the scalding that would occur from this, this uh, glowing coal from the altar. And he was purified. My brothers and sisters, you cannot cleanse yourself. You cannot 
purify yourself. Purification and forgiveness and cleansing and the work of transformation can only be done by God based upon God's choice in choosing you and calling you. We are dependent, utterly dependent, upon the grace and mercy of God for the cleansing of our hearts and souls. If we want to overcome the bad habits and the things in our lives that indicate and bear witness that we so often are inadequate in the face of the challenges that come to us from the gospel of Jesus, do not fear. God is merciful and God will do the job of transforming your heart and your soul. You just have to be willing to allow God to do that work in your life and in your heart. That's all it takes. And so Isaiah was overcome by this uh, vision and as they sang this song, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It is a reminder to all those of us who are Christians that we worship a God that is a trinity in unity, a unity in trinity. Holy is the Father. Holy is the eternal Word made flesh, the Son, and holy is the Spirit, the blessed three in one. And so we see, even in the prophetic era before Christ, that there is an indication of the mystery of the nature of God as a mystery of three in one. And so as Isaiah stood in this temple, he was overhearing the conversation. God was having a conversation with whom we do not know for sure. This, this passage is somewhat ambiguous. Some have suggested he was talking to the angels. Some had suggested that this was an inner conversation between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, as illustrated in Rublev's icon of the three angels around the table in conversation with one another. And so as Isaiah was overhearing this conversation, uh, the conversation went like this. God was saying, I wonder who will go for us. Who can we send out to take a message to the people, my people? And Isaiah, like a young child, uh, when adults are talking, couldn't contain himself, and he spoke up and interrupted God's conversation. I know this is an experience I frequently have, being a father, and I have uh, many children, but I have one particular son who gets so excited about adult conversations, all of a sudden he's entering into the conversation, and we're all looking at him. <laughs> Maybe that was uh, uh, the response of God, but what was so beautiful was Isaiah offered this prayer and offered himself to God. Here am I, send me. I'll go. <laughs> and that's the calling of the prophet. And he became one of the greatest prophets of Israel. Well known and well remembered. And we hear his voice even today in the course of the liturgy throughout the year because quite often we read from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The gospel today is also a story of calling. It is an, uh, a very touching story. Uh, it's the calling of the fishermen, and you're familiar with that. The fishermen are on the, uh, uh, fishing in the uh, Sea of Galilee along the shore there. They're cleaning their nets, and along comes Jesus. But in this account, uh, we have some details that are lacking in the other Gospels. And it is something that is unique to Luke in this particular narrative. And this particular narrative focuses on a particular individual whose name was Simon, and we would later come to know him as Peter. He would become a disciple of Jesus. But before he was a disciple of Jesus, he was living out his ordinary life, making a living. He had a fishing business, and it was quite successful. And uh, he even had some partners in that fishing business, besides his brother Andrew. And he also had uh, the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. And uh, on this particular story, we are given a setting. Jesus is now walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee because there, nestled within the verdant hills uh, of, uh, of Galilee, there is a valley, and in that valley there is a lake, and it's the freshwater lake called the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias. It had many names, but it's the same body of water. And these men had lived out their lives uh, and made their living by fishing along the sea there and out in their fishing boats. And Jesus one day was walking along the shore of Galilee. Now Galilee is not a smooth beach. It has a rocky shore. 
and the stones that make up the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee have been worn smooth by the constant movement of the waters for millennia. And so as you walk along the beach there or along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, uh, if you're barefoot, you can feel the wet, smooth stones beneath your feet as you look out across the beautiful blue expanse of the sea and look beyond at the green hills. But as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, there were multitudes of people that were following after him, great crowds, and he was teaching them as he was walking along the sea. And all of a sudden, they come upon these fishermen who had been fishing all night. Their boats are pulled up along the shore, and, um, and they're cleaning their nets. They're minding their own business. And all of a sudden, as they're cleaning their nets, doing business as usual, they look up and they see a massive crowd around them of people. And they see this rabbi, this carpenter from Nazareth, who was teaching the crowds. I'm sure they were quite taken by this experience. And they would be so even more because of the next thing that happens. Jesus tells one of the disciples, Simon, or he's not a disciple yet, one of the fishermen, Simon, to take his boat and push it out a little bit out into the water, a, a little bit of a distance, just a few yards away. And Jesus climbed on Simon's boat. He didn't ask permission. God doesn't ask you permission when he invades your life. For as far as God is concerned, he possesses everything that you own. It belongs to him. So Jesus got on Simon's boat, but it was actually now Jesus' boat. <laughs> And he makes it into his pulpit, and he sits down cross-legged on their deck, and he continues to proclaim his message and to teach the multitudes who are gathered along the stony shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. You see, the crowd, press of the crowd was so great, perhaps Jesus was uh, going to be pushed into the water. So he got, he got a safe distance away, and he continued to teach. And you know, he didn't preach for 15 or 20 minutes. He went on for hours in the hot sun as the day started to wax long. And as he was there, he concluded his teaching and he turns to Simon the fisherman and he said to him, let us go out into the deep and you can let down your nets for a big catch. Now, Simon Peter responds. And what is interesting is that if you read between the lines, you get a feeling he is responding sarcastically. Note what he says. You know, we've been fishing all night. And the best time to fish is in the shallows in nightfall, throughout the hours, the early hours of the morning before sunrise. We know every inch of this lake. I know about fishing. I'm an expert. I do it for a living. I do this every day, except for the Sabbath, because I'm a good Jew. <laughs> and I made a lot of money doing this. You're just a carpenter. A rabbi from Nazareth. You know nothing about fishing. We were out there all night and we caught absolutely nothing. But okay. I can just see Simon wanting to humor Jesus. He'll humor the prophet. He'll say, okay, this is what you want to do. Uh, we'll go out there. We'll throw our nets in the middle of the day, in the deep of the lake. And everybody knows it's impossible to catch fish that way. So they go out. And they throw out their nets. And all of a sudden, to the surprise of this fisherman, Simon, the nets were straining at the load of fish that they had caught. So much so that his boat began to capsize. So he had to call over his fishing fishermen partners, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and they came over with their boat. And they had to pull that net, and they gathered the fish, and they filled both boats to the point that they were almost sinking. Jesus now had Simon's attention, wouldn't you think? <laughs> and Simon now, realizing he saw something he had never seen in his entire life as a fisherman, he knew this was a miracle, that this was impossible based upon the evidence of his observations and experiences throughout his life. And so he came to this Jesus, and he looked at him with the same kind of fear that Isaiah had in the temple 700 years before when he saw this great vision of Almighty God upon the throne in the temple. And so Peter falls on his face and he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I'm a foolish, sinful man. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. 
like Isaiah the prophet who beheld Almighty God, now Simon beholds the life of God within this humble carpenter rabbi from Nazareth, and he realizes that he's in the presence. And as soon as he had this epiphany, this revelation of the person of Jesus, he also at the same time has a revelation about himself. He realizes the truth about himself. He realizes how inadequate he is. He realizes how far he has fallen short of the reality of God's will. Depart from me. And how does Jesus respond? Note this, my brothers and sisters. He didn't say, you need to grovel a little bit more. You're pretty sinful. No, he didn't do that. He lifts him up. That's the way Jesus is. He lifts you up, my brothers and sisters. No matter how far you have fallen, no matter how far you feel you have sunk and failed in life, Jesus is always there with his strong hands and strong arms to lift you up. And he says to Peter, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. There was a call in Simon's life. Simon felt he was unworthy of that call. He was even given a new name, Peter. And he became the follower of Jesus. He became, in some people's minds, the preeminent apostle, follower of Jesus. This is the transformation that Jesus did in his life. He was transformed into an ordinary fisherman, into an extraordinary apostle, because the call of God was upon his life. Jesus then extends that invitation to the rest of the disciples, to all of us. God has laid claim upon our lives, my brothers and sisters. We may think this is my life, I can do with what I please, but there is one who has laid claim upon your life. There is one who calls you even now. You might say, you might object, but I'm too old. You might think, well, I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough education in religious matters. Or I'm too sick, or I'm too ill, or I have so many limitations. It's not about the condition of your life. It is about the possibility and the power of God as he laid claim on your life. God's call is upon you. He wants to use you to bless this world and to participate with him in the great work of redemption by bringing the love of God to every person that you meet. Because you are in a unique circle of life. You have unique connections with people. And God is calling you to be that person who will bring the good news of hope of joy and peace and life. This happened to St. Paul the Apostle. He was minding his own business, and it wasn't good business at all. He was a religious fanatic, and he wanted to go like the Inquisitor and go after these new believers in Jesus and throw them in the prison and have them put to death. He was Saul of Tarsus. He worked for the Sanhedrin. He had official letters. And on his way to Damascus, the risen Christ appeared to him and laid claim upon his life and that irresistible moment, Saul of Tarsus knew the truth about who he was as he realized the truth about who Jesus was. And his life was transformed. St. Paul, which was the former Saul of Tarsus, realized his call. Isaiah realized his call. Simon Peter realized his call. A young virgin maiden named Mary of Nazareth realized her call. My brothers and sisters, there is a call upon your life today. And it's a call that you would be one who would be like the psalmist we heard today. That you would sing a song of praise before the angels. In the presence of the angels. And he's not just meaning the afterlife. He's meaning right now. Because there are countless angels around us at all times. And our lives are called to be lives dedicated to the praise of God and to give glory to him and to be witnesses of his love and grace. That is the call which is upon your heart, even as I speak to you this morning. This is indeed the word of the Lord for you. Amen. Let us stand together as we profess our faith.